We were, we were pretty heavy. It's, it's just gonna like, get heavier. Say that one more time. You're touching on a lot of very important points. I'm gonna get this cat out of here. <laughs> like, hopefully that works. I don't like think it it'll helped. work. Hi, welcome to Wine with Adam. I'm your host, Adam Scott Bellows, and today I am here with our very special guest, Michal Kotler Wunsch, uh, international law expert, member of parliament or Knesset, uh, mother, wife. Uh, what else are you? How many hats do you wear? You're in the middle of finishing your PhD as well. I am. Fighter of, of human rights, fighter for immigrants in this country. So I'm also, in addition to all that, in terms of the multiplicity of my identities, and thank you for that no wonderful problem. introduction, because I think that that's really important. That's my introduction of you without notes. <laughs> so having all those um, identities, and I am also a Jew, and I am a Canadian, and I'm an Israeli. So I'd like to let everybody know, today we are doing Wine with Adam from Hanaton at the Jezreel Valley Winery, and we are gonna be enjoying the Jezreel Valley Adamim, which is 60% Syrah, 25% Carignan, and 15% Argamat. And you were telling me that those are all... These are all very Mediterranean blends. The entire idea with this winery is to try to create the first modern Israeli winery that focuses on Mediterranean blends and kind of encapsulates the um, Israeli spirit in a bottle of wine. And because Hanaton has such incredible history. Such incredible history, people don't realize. Uh, you know, this was the place where many stories of the Bible took place. This is where Elijah fought the prophets of Baal. This is where the Northern Kingdom's entire center of life was. So do me a favor, tell me what you smell. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you taste. I mean, the color is beautiful. I smell ruby red roses, if that makes sense. I smell berries. Ooh, berries, yeah, definitely. It's good. It's really good. It's really good. Sounds dry. I'd like to kind of have your take on like what it was like to grow up with, you know, your, your mother was the assistant to Menachem Begin. Uh, you were there when Begin left the opposition and became prime minister. So when you're surrounded by the types of people that achieved these types of things, I would assume it had to have had a ridiculously strong impression on you. So, so first of all, I'll tell you that it's very, very humbling as to what it's like. Um, I was raised as, a, as an only child in the 70s in Israel. That wasn't the simplest thing. And the first heroine of the story is actually my mom. Um, and she was indeed the parliamentary secretary for the Likud party and Begin's um, secretary, legislative assistant. And before he became prime minister, before the night of what's known as the Mahapach, the overturning of the government. <laughs> He was the leader of the opposition, and he was a fierce leader of the opposition. And when we look at that understanding of being an opposition leader at a time where um, the gaps societally in the state of Israel were tremendous in mm -hmm. terms of social mobility. Um, and the understanding that Begin had that the most important thing that he could champion was the internal unity and resiliency of Israeli society. Um, it was that that came through in everything that he did. It was through his own understanding and through his own humility that he was able to relate to everybody, to people who didn't have social mobility. And again, I refer to another great woman, and that is Eliza Begin, Zichali Vracha. Me? <laughs> because Eliza Begin understood that she had to speak to the mothers, speaking of women, in order to enable social mobility. So, Poyek Chikum Shkunot, and the company that built the buildings was called Pozot, and it was all about social housing, enabling, ultimately, social mobility to the children that were growing up in neighborhoods that they would have none. And the way that Eliza Begin understood that that would be 
a possibility was by bringing mothers into a room, by bringing the mothers of children. Women don't cry. I think that we can't afford it. It is a luxury. Perhaps others can do it. But we can't cry in sorrow because we must be strong in order to support the men and our children. I want to get a couple of words on what it was like to grow up with your dad. Because I think this is where a lot of your passion comes from. I mean, I might be wrong, but I don't know how somebody could see and understand the things about the world that you are so exposed to at, at a young age, you know, based on your father's work. I mean, w what was that like knowing that your father was helping free Nelson Mandela and Natan Sharansky? I mean, it's like case after case after case. I mean, so, so you're right. We spoke about human rights before through Begin's perspective. And actually, 1977, the year of, you know, that night that I sat in the Knesset cafeteria and was carried on the shoulders of giants in a euphoric outbreak of dance, yeah. which is what happened that night, um, was also the year that my parents actually met around the Sharansky case. So um, my mother, speaking of another great woman, alongside Natan Sharansky, then known as Anatoly Sharansky, was Avital Sharansky. Mm -hmm. So Avital actually, um, committed her life to sounding that voice. And my father indeed built the legal case and cause, the Sharansky case, that's what it's called. It's, um, it's a huge book. We still have it. I tell people it's the size of a phone book and nobody knows what that was. It's, it's bigger than his really new big. book? <laughs> yes, really, really big. Um, thousands of pages and it went to every head of state. Wow. And the, the Sharansky case um, and the case and cause of, of Soviet Jews in general, um, and at the time, of course, Ida Nudel and you know many others, was important in the sense that it made the world realize that there was our personal responsibility for what it is. It's not just theoretical, right? International law is not something that is theoretical, that we've created to um, you know, enable a relationship between countries and understand what the laws of war look like when we have war, which is, you know. How would you but, define international law? International law is the only framework that exists currently that regulates the relationships between countries and between individuals of those countries and citizens of the world. With a capital I or a lowercase i? Well, that depends on how we utilize it, right? That's up to us. That's like, th th that's where the personal responsibility comes in. And what we do with it actually shapes what it'll be. And, um, and, and actually what we can do with it, and we see that happening today too, un can undermine mm -hmm. potentially that only organizational structure that exists. So I was really privy to that, and that's when my parents met around, right? My, um, my, uh, my mother was very good friends with Avital, and my father was writing the Sharansky case, and they spent their nights falling in love, but also writing the Sharansky case. You refer to, you know, me being um, exposed to the tremendous, I would say, the giants of, of that generation. Wow. They were, um, they were the generation, or the founding generation of this country. And I'll say, Adam, we're still the founding generation of this country. <laughs> the country is not the donkey. As I'm talking about the founding generation Jewish of this country. A, a jackass a starts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we still are. <laughs> Double standards are a common theme with you. you. You fight double standards in the ICC, on social media. You've addressed the heads of Twitter and put them on. You actually said it's okay to call for genocide, but it's not okay to provide political commentary. And their response didn't answer your question. You made global news when you did that. It was, it was on CNN, it was on Fox. It... Actually, local news didn't cover it. Not even a little bit. Yeah. We had these four hearings in the Knesset, which did make it across the ocean because we engaged with the digital platforms on the imperative to, first of all, define a problem in order to combat it. Right? Again, I said, I'm a big believer in definitions. If you don't know what it is, how are you going to combat it? And there is, lucky for us, actually an internationally accepted definition for anti-Semitism, the IRA working definition. So IRA does something which we need to understand very deeply. It converges you know, older forms of anti-Semitism that we're more familiar with, right. with a new form of anti-Semitism, which is anti-Zionism, right? In that IRA actually includes what's known as the three Ds, 
demonization, delegitimization, and double standard. Indeed. What is the difference between criticism, I get asked very mm -hmm. often, and delegitimization? Well, the very right of the state of Israel to exist, the only single Jewish state in the entire world, is exactly where that delegitimization is important to understand. And IRA is a key resource to highlight why that is unacceptable. But you're touching on a lot of very important points, Adam. Too, probably too many no, it's important okay. points, and I'm gonna get this cat out of here. <laughs> like, hopefully that works. Looks I don't like think it helped. Work. Uh, what do you want me to do? We talked about the digital platforms and the double standards and the engaging with, not combating, not conflicting with, not at war with. No, conversation has conversation to Conversation with the digital platforms because with the tremendous power that they have comes even greater responsibility. And that tremendous power means that if there is a problem of any kind, and let's say anti-Semitism is the one we're talking about at the moment, we first have to define it. That guiding definition for anti-Semitism has to guide them in creating policy, which is then, of course, transparent and consistently applied to those that violate it. And that it's not just about anti-Semitism. I used to call it, you know, the canary in the mine shaft. And after engaging in this, I realize it's more than that. Anti-Semitism is actually the predictive example for how disinformation works on digital platforms. Say that one more time. Anti-Semitism right. is a predictive example for how disinformation of all kinds works on digital platforms using technology, right? The algorithm that identifies what your echo chamber is going to look like knows to create exactly that. It knows to find what I call lacunae, gaps in the law. It's an ever-existing gap, because it's math. It's an ever-existing gap that enables disinformation of the kind that we saw affecting January 6th on Capitol Hill. The greatest part about it is we as legislators don't necessarily have the technological understanding. Mm -hmm. But now that we've engaged with a technology that is available, it corroborates the hunch that we can actually trace this. We can actually track this. Right. And in that sense, we come empowered to the engagement with the digital platforms and as legislators with creating solutions because humanity has been here before. And that's not to say necessarily that we believe that it should be removed, but it definitely needs to be flagged as anti-Semitic content and utilized in educational ways in order to understand what anti-Semitism looks like. We have to take a, can we take a minute just to decompress for a second and maybe, sure. maybe it gets a little bit lighter because we were, we were pretty heavy. It's, it's gonna saying. get heavier. Like, like we need to, we need to have it's gonna the, get heavier. we need to have the lightness of wine with Adam. We're, we're being so serious. You, you have an understanding of Jewish peoplehood that isn't of your generation. Yeah. I feel like it's of my generation. Yeah. Like if that makes what, sense. That? Like, really? It, how do I explain this? That makes this? me feel better. No, it, it should because, yeah. because I don't hear people your age speak about being Jewish the way that you do. You know, very few people. But like, the biggest thing for me when I was in college was is that there aren't any leaders that are inspiring. And, and the big thing is, is that the, the difference between the founding generation and the generation that's leading this country now is that I don't care what anybody says. When was the last time Bibi Netanyahu got on a podium and addressed the nation to inspire them? There's no vision. There's no vision. There's no vision. Everybody's running from thing to thing to thing to thing to and thing. And I'll tell you where we're at. <clears throat> where we're at is that the balance has shifted and Israel is not only a home for Israelis, it is the home of the Jewish people. Right, and we've forgotten that. We have completely and utterly forgotten that. Um, tell me when we're ready. ready. So I ask everybody this question as their last question since we've gone over time and my editors are going to kill me. I really like this question that I kind of came up with when I was with Natan and Gil. If I was 12 years old, give me one sentence that you would want to impart on me that could give me everything that you could? I'll answer that, but first I'll say you have to tell me what Natan and Gil, who I adore <laughs> both, you'll have to tell me later what they both said. I'll show After you. I, I will show you. you. I will show you what they said. At the end of the day, um, and I, all my kids are older than 12 already, uh, but I would say that the most important thing, and I say this to teens and to university students all the time, is listen to your inner voice and seek knowledge. That is harder and harder to um, make available to people because we live in a digital reality and in echo chambers. So seeking knowledge is the ability to actually formulate your own opinion. And we spoke about the dangers of living in echo chambers and safe spaces and trigger warnings and we could talk a lot about that. Seek knowledge on your own and create the ability for yourself to form your own opinion 
and then listen to your inner voice. Because you do know, you do know, and you have the ability to think, and you have the responsibility to think. And again, if there's anything of Rabbi Sachs's legacy, and we talked about that a little bit about this before, that was not it, was not, it was not superhuman. It was very human. It was about seeking knowledge so that we take the responsibility we have to formulate our own opinions and are able to listen to that inner voice um, and champion what we believe in. That's what I would tell you at 12. Wow. That was damn good. But you have to tell me what Gil. That was yeah, damn good. I'm sure good. Gil and Natan said something uh, uh, <laughs> n n n So I want to I wanna thank you for joining me for Wine with Adam. Thank it's you. an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, we're uh, obviously going to have to do this again. And uh, I look forward to getting to continue to work with you and speak with you and learn from you. And um, it's Wine with Adam. We're at Jezreel Valley Winery drinking the Hadumim, Michal Kotler Munch. Have a wonderful day. L'chaim. <laughs> <laughs>